All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to day two. You are here for the international premiere of White Boy Rick. My name is Carrie Craddock. I'm the director of programming for the festival. To begin, we would like to acknowledge that tonight's event is taking place on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of New Credit and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work in this community. This film is eligible for the Girls People's Choice Award. Vote for all of your favorite films at tiff.net slash vote. A huge thank you to Sony Pictures Releasing for providing us with this film tonight. They're great partners of the festival, so a round of applause for them. Thank you. The director of tonight's film, Jan Demange, was last here with a little film, his first feature uh, called 71. Uh, any of you remember that one? Yay. Yeah. <laughs> um, 71 really announced Jan as an incredibly talented filmmaker, and we're thrilled to have him back here with White Boy Rick, even though it took a few years. White Boy Rick is based on the real-life events of Ricky Wurst Jr. Uh, it's quite a ride, and I think features energetic direction that is full of emotion and amazing performances from the likes of Matthew McConaughey, Bruce Dern, Belle Powdley, Jonathan Majors, Jennifer Jason Lee, and a newcomer who you might not know, but you definitely will after tonight, Richie Merritt. Uh, a lot of them are here for an introduction and a Q&A after the screening, so please stick around. Without further ado, though, please join me in welcoming to the stage the director of White Boy Rick, Jan Demange. Hello. Wow, it's lively. Thank you so much. Oh, I love it here. Um, wow, good turnout. Thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce my cast. I've got a lot of my cast here, and um, I owe them everything, actually. They were incredible to work with. So I'm going to start with the incredible Belle Powley. <laughs> From London, you'd never know it. Incredibly talented Jonathan Majors. A star, for sure. I'm going to bring out RJ. Ishtar. Buddha. OK, and introducing, in the first role of his entire life, we found this kid he'd never acted before, Richie Merritt. And my partner in crime making this film, incredible Matthew McConaughey. <laughs> All right, look, introducing a film's always a bit dull. Um, we've got a Q&A after, so we'll, we'll hold it for then. I hope you enjoy it, and uh, if you've got anything to ask, we'll be here after the film. Thank you so much for coming, okay? Thank you for staying to the end. Oh, Matthew. I thought I was had to introduce you I last. I am not John Lesher. <laughs> Where are John they? Lesher? No. There they are. Let's get the rest of the cast. Bell Powley. Everybody, Bell Powley. Thank you for staying. There's John Lesher and Scott Franklin, my producers. Who Let's get Jonathan Majors out here. Oh, yeah. Ooh. Let's get RJ up here. And let's get Richie. Um, I think I'd like to start this by asking you a question, Jan. This is um, obviously a story of great injustice, but also... Oh, we should get the rest up here. You want more? The Buddha and Ishtar, come up here. And, and Raekwon, stand up here, stand. Be a part of the family.
Simon, sorry. All right, you ready for this now? We can do it? Okay. Uh, so I was saying, I think this is a story of great injustice, obviously, but it's also, I think, a really um, you know, important story about uh, the relationship between a father and a son and the bond that they have, and wondering kind of why you wanted to tell this story. Um, well, I wanted to tell the story because of the father and son story. I mean, and then I had to get to grips with the injustice, or I, I don't think of it in those terms, like the, the, uh, the procedural elements. The, um, I was actually sent the article, an article that got purchased by another studio like a year and a half before I came on board for this one. And I read it and I was like, oh, this is an incredible sort of informant story and a bog standard, really not that incredible drug dealer story. He's not a Scarface or anything. Um, and I was like, wow, they really abused this kid. I read it and it was like, I don't really want to make the movie, but I passed, but I was like, wow, that's sort of stayed with me. And, I, and a year and a half later, Studio 8, Jeff Robinoff, yeah. who should be up here, really. Should we get Jeff up here? <laughs> Jeff, get up here. <laughs> you won't get up. There he is. There he is. Jeff Robinoff. Get up here, Jeff. So Jeff Robinoff uh, and John Lesher, like Jeff Robinoff purchased this, you know, this spec uh, and with John Lesher. And they sent it to me, and I was working with John on something else, and I was like, do you want to read this? And I did, and, and they were, uh, I was, again, not enamored with the rise and fall, not remotely enamored with the informant story, but they were like, the first 20 pages, with it, they, there was this father-son relationship that then disappeared. But I was like, oh my God, you know, the, the, I have to say the Miller brothers, who I believe are here, wrote this story. <laughs> They wrote this incredible, like this incredible, these incredible scenes that stayed down there, that the gun show and the custard tarts, and then these moments that weren't actually didn't stay in the front end of this, but these very moving father and son scenes. They captured this voice that utterly, I was not very candid about it at the time, but it utterly spoke to me personally about me and my father, who had some funky opinions on the world. <laughs> And uh, I've been untagging that the, the rest of my life. But like, it was a very personal connection with the father and son relationship. I only, I only wrote one screenplay, feature screenplay, I never, met, I never made set in Algeria, and it was called Father. So I was obviously obsessed with father-son stories, and that's what struck me. And then it made me look at the kid, and I was like, wow, I kind of identify with this kid as an outsider. You know, I was mixed race. I never had a sense of tribe. Uh, my oldest brother had a different father. His father was West Indian. My father was North African. Our mother was white blonde. Our middle brother was n indigenous uh, Native American. My other brother on my, on my dad's side with a different mother's full-blown Algerian. We were like eclectic mess. And I never had a sense of tribe and a sense of place. And I started to identify with this kid who was trying to seek the paternal elsewhere, was was loved for his family, was trying to, do, so I just, I engaged with it on an emotional level. And then I had a responsibility <laughs> to get to grips with the procedural uh, informant story and the facts. I had to tell the facts of why he is still in jail and how it played out. Um, maybe a question for um, Richie and Matthew um, on stage and, and Belle as well. Uh, this was obviously a true story, and maybe you could talk a little bit about how you prepared and whether you met some of the people that are on screen. Sure. Uh, you want to head up first? Yeah, I'll go first. Can you hear me? Can there we go. Me? Okay. Testing, testing. You got me? All right. Well, um, you know, me and Rick have a lot of similarities. Oh, you. Richie, come on. <laughs> you know. Can we have a moment? Rick. You know. He'd never so much I, as I drama. Know you had to speak so He'd loud. never even no. done a drama class before. No, 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 no. He didn't even know who Matthew McConaughey was. No, definitely, definitely not. But, um, That's true. Know, didn't. Me, me and Rick got a lot of similarities and stuff. You know, Easy, uh, bro. You can hear me? Oh, yeah, that, that one was broke. That one was <laughs> broke. You, you, you gave me a dud. Why'd you give me that one? You know that was broke. Oh, but, um... You know, me, me and Matt, me and, uh, yeah, I really didn't know, know Matthew. 
at the beginning of this until I actually, you know, got the solid space. But um, yeah, me and Rick uh, definitely have a lot of similarities. You know, uh, our moms left out at an early age at us, and you know, it just I took a lot of my personal life to put into this. You know, I kind of had to think about, you know, obviously my mom leaving, and um, you know, my brother went to jail, so I had to use that in uh, the jail scenes. You know, it was just like a great opportunity to do this with y'all. It was like a real blessing, and I'm I'm really thankful that God brought y'all into my life. And like y'all really helped me out through this, and thank you very much, Scott, and thank you, Matthew, and thank you, Yan. Yeah. yeah, for uh, for me, when I first read the script, I uh, did not know the story, but it was obvious to me after the first read that it was a story that deserved to be told, even if it was fiction which it was not. So uh, it was more than an added bonus that it was based in truth. It gave a lot more resonance to it and a lot more reason and purpose for it to be told. Um, personally, this was a very different role for me than I've ever taken on. Um, I usually play the man who does unto by hook or by crook, and this, this father gets done unto <laughs> and loses every single round that he is in. Um, I knew a lot of fathers who have been parenting, uh, trying to be best friends with their, their children, which isn't the best recipe for being a good parent. Um, some single parent homes, there's all the instability there. Um, and there's also a story about some families and uh, a man that I got to play that are living on the hopes of the future, but just reciting the nostalgia of the past. Therefore, they're paralyzed in the present and cannot move, and it's just cyclical. Um, and then tonight, by watching it again, I just realized and noticed what the, the birth of your daughter did for the movie. And I know what it did for, for uh, Rick, where she's seen. He had all this new hope again. It's going to work out. A new generation. We can erase the past. We can, we, can make, we can get on with it, which does not happen. So the story, the, uh, the man, and I also wanted to work with uh, the man I call Jan de Manche. His name is really Jan de Manche. <laughs> um, and we were off. Yeah. You can keep quitting me on if you want. I'll roll with it. Um, I didn't know anything about White Boy Rick, and honestly, 80s Detroit couldn't be further from my upbringing, being from the UK. But um, one day we were in rehearsal, we hadn't even started shooting yet, and we were having dinner, me, you, and Richie, and you went off to take a phone call, and then you came back and you handed me the phone. You were like, oh, it's Rick. And I was like, what? The, the real Rick? And you were like, yeah, he wants to talk to you. And we were just sitting around the dinner table, and I was on the phone to Rick, and he was literally with the most gracious, like, open person. And he just, I sat and chatted to him for like 45 minutes, and he just told me all these stories about his sister and his upbringing, and those are things that pertain to the movie. And that was kind of just pretty incredible. And we spoke to him all the time throughout filming. I mean, Matthew obviously met him, but Richie and I just talked to him. Um, yeah. He took he took you he took Richie as well under his wing. He was like really close. We'd have him on speakerphone occasionally, talking to the crew. You know, um, I wouldn't necessarily do it that way again, but like it, it was it was important in this instance because you hear a lot of directors going, "Well, I tell a true story. I don't I don't talk to the person. Fuck that." Like, and I understand that. But in this instance, I, I just held, I had an obligation to keep him involved in the mix, you know. Um, I had a, sort of an emotional investment in him. And even though I was like, look, man, I'm not doing a biography. I mean, he had three kids by the time he was 17 with three different baby mothers, <laughs> all right? The kids, the guy's got a lot of grandkids, and he went, he's been in jail since he was 17. <laughs> he did well with the time he had. But, like, he... Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I wasn't his biographer, but I f felt a, a, a terrible sense of uh, the weight of, you know, a moral obligation to try and get certain things right. And it was good to keep him involved as well, because it, it, you know, the guy, the guy's in this on lockdown for God fuck knows how long, right? And it was great. He was talking to everyone, and he was he was great talking Very to the positive. cast. And the thing about him, he doesn't think he's a victim. Uh, he doesn't try and pretend he was innocent. He's full of humility. And the overriding thing with him is he's fucking funny. <laughs> it always makes you laugh. 
and you know, you'd have Ricky on the phone, and it was incredibly emotional when I said, look, this is the way we're gonna go. I'm casting the studio backing me, Jeff. I mean, geez, the, the bravery. <laughs> A, a non-actor, we're gonna go with a non-actor. He was like, uh, really? Yeah. Okay. Um, and, but he comes from a similar background. He's not faking it. He's genuinely growing up in a certain environment and, and he's not pretending he's been around the African-American community. He's, he is it, but um, he's very similar to Rick's circumstance. And when I told Rick, when we spoke on the phone, he, it's the first time he'd ever been emotional, or well, second time, when he spoke about his father, it's the first, and the second time when I told him I was casting this kid, he was like, what, he's a non-actor? And he's like, I told him about his background, and he just got emotional. And there was this moment, he's like, I can't believe that, you know, if nothing else happens with this film, like, somehow I'm giving a kid that might have been like me an opportunity to be in a Hollywood movie. He was like, this is fucking crazy. <laughs> and that was yeah. pretty cool. We want to try to get out to you guys for a couple questions, but Jonathan, I would love to hear from you because this is an important father-son story, but you're also an important father figure in the film, and I'm wondering if you can talk about um, what this role meant to you. Yeah, thanks. Happy uh, birthday, oh. Happy birthday hey. Jonathan. A fucking superstar, Jonathan Majors. Uh, thanks, bro. Um, yeah, John, Johnny Curry um, and the Curry family. Um, I think it's interesting because it's a story of, uh, of families and there's no, there's no father in the Curry household. And so you have this young man in his 30s essentially being big brother, father, provider, CEO, president of uh, an entire uh, uh, culture of people. And the absence of that, I think, is the absence of the father for the Curries is one of the biggest driving forces because there's no one to look up to. Um, Johnny has no one to look up to, so he has to lead. And he leads the best way he can with the best tools he has, which is to live in the society and find a way to manipulate the society in a way that he and his family, his tribe, can survive and move forward. Um, and when society gets hip to that and they declare a war on it, um, he has no guidance. So he does what he does and goes harder. And in doing so, it ultimately le le leads to the, the downfall of his people, um, of the Curry brothers and, and, and then the baby boy, Ricky. So, yeah. Thank Thanks. you. Okay, we have time for a couple of questions from you guys. I'll go towards the very back on the floor, towards the aisle. Go ahead. So a bit of a comment there about the very authentic production design in the film, and I'll, I'll also say yeah, I think Detroit really emerges as a character in the movie. Can you talk a little bit about how you got it um, to feel so right, including like you mentioned the skating rink and all of the houses? And um, well, we got to give a big out, big shout out to Stefania Cello. I can't be here, the production designer, <laughs> who uh, John John Lesher in fact introduced me to because they made another movie together. And he said, look, she's a genius, got to meet her. She's crazy, but you'll love her. And uh, he's right. And I love her. Like the, um, it's the same way I did 71 or anything. The authenticity is a big thing for me. Like just, you know, to, to, to try and give an experiential, I love experiential films rather than a, t a story told from a distance. You know, you want to try and create a world that's 360 and capture it on the move rather than cover it. Um, a bit wanky about it but, but so basically yes very for the forensic i get quite geeky about looking at images because I'm, I'm better looking at pictures than i'm reading books and um we look we look at a lot of texture like actually we meet a lot of people i love talking to i love, I love witness accounts i love uh, i did a lot of that on 71 people just getting a sense of tone from people that lived it and when they talk about it it's not necessarily what they say sometimes the way they say it they give me something from it uh, images uh, and we create a lookbook 
and we, we exchange images. And I'm making it sound like it's me, but it's not just me. It's like everybody involved in the band. It's, it's like, you know, everyone. John might send a picture, look at this. Uh, Franklin, uh, our producer, send a picture. Everyone involved would send images. As you, as you bring someone on board, they bring something to the party. And it's like living space for everybody to have input. And then, um, and then you know, casting the net wide and then distilling it to what the palette will be for your film. But in terms of the research of getting it right, the textures, it was imperative. You know, I went, I went to the every single real location of his life. And I didn't necessarily recreate them because I'm not into mimicking. I, you know, I still want the mise-en-scene and the, and, and the images to feel right for the, for the mood of the story. But I certainly tried to get a capture of the feeling of it all. Okay, we have time for one more question from the audience. Anybody? Okay, we're gonna go, nobody on the balcony. Okay, we're gonna go down here, just middle on the aisle. Yep, yep. Oh, this is, uh, I feel like we need one more after this. But yeah, the question is, um, is it gonna be released? It's coming out soon. There's lots of trailers, right? Do I, no, next week. Oh, is he gonna be released? Okay, that's a good one, Tan. He doesn't come out with the movie, unfortunately. <laughs> We've been working on that. <laughs> he, um, it's a complicated thing. He has a hearing in December. Who knows what, which way the wind would blow? We can't be presumptuous and say when he's gonna come out. That will ruffle feathers. In worst case scenario, 2020, 2021, in the best case scenario, mm, sooner. <laughs> but we can't go there for legal reasons. Is that right? Yeah. Right. But he is off his life sentence. He basically owed, he owed four or five years to Florida. This is what happened, family. It's all about family, right? His mother and his sister got involved in the car ring. There were stolen cars. He made a phone call, introduced one person to somebody else in, Flor in Miami, and then they got busted. And then he was already on a life sentence. He was like, fuck it, I'll take the hit. So it was me. So he, he owed Florida five years, but what's five years to help your mother and your sister when you're already on life? But he got off the life sentence and, uh, and then he's, now he's in Florida. Okay, well, congratulations on the film and bringing his story to the screen. Thank you all for coming.